Good evening and welcome. My name is So Young Lee, and I'm the Landon and Lavinia Clay Chief Curator of the Harvard Art Museums. And I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's program, Redefine the Landscape, Howardina Pindell, Kara Walker, and Carrie James Marshall. <clears throat> Before we begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we strive to honor this relationship. Since the Harvard Art Museums closed our doors almost exactly one year ago, the ongoing global pandemic has radically changed the role of the museum, how we engage both with our collection and with the various communities of which the museum is or strives to be a part. And during this time, as with the larger society, we have been challenged to confront and interrogate difficult histories and questions, including structures of inequalities and racism. And throughout this past year, you, our audiences, have been our inspiration, reminding us of the power of art and of empathy. Now, while our building has been closed, our curatorial team has been thinking critically about critically about and re-examining our collections and redoubling our commitment to and passion for telling new stories and honing in on stories of peoples and communities um, who may not have been traditionally highlighted or who may have felt excluded from museum spaces. And since we are a museum with a long tradition and legacy, both inspiring on the one hand and at times complicated or problematic on the other, and also with a large collection spanning much of the globe and much of the time, we have a lot of material to mine. And we're really excited to begin sharing this work with you this spring. Yesterday, we kicked off a series of art talks focused on Reframe, a museum-wide initiative to reimagine the function the potential and the future of the University Art Museum. And tonight, I am thrilled to welcome my colleagues, Mary Schneider Enriquez and Chastity Weinstock for a conversation about three artists, Howardina Pindell, Kara Walker, and Carrie James Marshall, who have had a transformative impact on our collections, spaces, and our teaching, as well as on the broader landscape of the art world, and not least on the question of race and representation. Mary and Chastity will be discussing a selection of key works by these three artists from our collection. And before we get started, um, Chastity, if I may have the next slide, please. I want to share a few logistical notes. We are using the webinar format, format in Zoom, and so you'll notice that your videos and microphones are turned off or muted. We invite you to submit your questions um, for our presenters using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And you, can, you may do that at any point during the presentation. We will plan to spend about 15 minutes at the end um, taking questions from the audience. And I will do my best to get to as many as possible, but we do have a large, rather large group today. So I apologize in advance if we don't, um, aren't able to address every question. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenters. Mary Schneider Enriquez is the Houghton Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And her scholarly interests focus on 20th and 21st century global art with special emphasis on art from Latin, art from Latin America, art and politics, sculpture and installation, and the work of Mark Rothko. Recent exhibitions have included Mark Rothko's Harvard Murals, 2014 to 15, Doris Salcedo, The Materiality of Mourning, 2016-17, Namjoon Peck's Screenplay, 2018, and most recently, I was about to say last year, but it was the year before, was it wasn't 2019, um, Crossing Lines, Constructing Home. Chastity Weinstock is a PhD candidate in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Harvard and a former graduate intern in the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. Chastity's dissertation is centered on the work 
of Mildred Thompson, Howardina Pindell, and Marin Hassinger, three African American women artists. And it's a study of a period of their artistic production from the 1960s and 1970s. So welcome, Chastity and Mary. And now I will hand the bat baton over to you. Thank you, So Young. I, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a really a pleasure to be doing this discussion with Chastity tonight. This, this discussion came about because we both had an interest and worked together um, on at least one of these artists. And um, I reached out to Chastity, and, and we discussed Kara Walker in particular, and decided that we wanted to go back to and reflect on work that we did in 2017 when we acquired the Kara Walker Drawing USA idioms. Actually, if you if you go ahead one uh, slide, please, Chastity, we put it up there. Um, Chastity was my was the graduate intern working closely with me on the installation, the text, the talks, everything about the exhibition we did um, in our contemporary gallery around the acquisition of this new work by Kara Walker. So this was the kind of thought of behind why we wanted to, to have this discussion tonight, because given what we have lived as a nation in the last, since we acquired this work in 2017, we thought it was a moment in which reflecting on this work and the work of Carrie James Marshall and Howard Dina Pindell in our collection, through the eyes of what we have lived in particular with um, Black Lives Matter, with George Floyd's murder, with the election and all of the break in our country, and furthermore, with January 6th, we thought it was a moment to really reflect on, relook at these artists' works in, in the moment we're, and in the context we're now living. So that was the kind of beginning for our, our um, reason for doing this discussion at this moment. All three artists have been made set dramatically important work, both for our collection, as So Young pointed out, but obviously for a much larger audience in the, in the world at large. Um, we called our discussion tonight, Redefine the Landscape, and it's really landscape, and we're thinking of it in, in four particular ways. Landscape as a private interior or exterior place, landscape as a geographical site, quite literally, Landscape as body, as the space, the place that bears um, wounds or shows the history that has occurred. And finally, landscape as the broader sense of the place in the museum, the place in the, in the art world, and the place that these artists hold in those three worlds and all of these uh, different landscapes. So We'll begin tonight, um, as I say, three artists we're going to look at in their work in our collection. The first being the reason we, we had the opportunity to work together in 2017 is this extraordinary drawing we acquired by Kara Walker, created in 2017 and quite literally created in response to the, the, the incident in Charlottesville, which was really little did we know the beginning of some of the, the really extraordinarily painful and complicated times we've lived as a nation um, with the uh, march and the, um, the, the death of those who were protesting the white supremacists. So she created this work in response to that and it's called USA Idioms. And it's very difficult to see in this slide how enormous this drawing is, but it is a drawing. It's a collage drawing of a scale that fills an entire wall of mural magnificent size. And the subject matter is very classic of, of Kara's work. And we're gonna go into that a little more deeply, but let's take a step back and look at how she began in the 90s, which is when her work focused, when she first got out of RISD, where she received her master's degree in fine arts, she had a, an exhibition at the Drawing Center in New York. And her first work were cut out silhouettes, silhouettes that covered the wall, telling the story of the legacy and the horror of of that endures from, of slavery, cutting out in black paper and pasting on a wall, covering an entire wall, an entire room, telling a kind of story that was both recognizable, horrifying, and at times had figures that we knew and didn't know, but not explicitly telling us what we were supposed to see, leaving the narrative for us to determine and the ambiguity to be very much on the surface. These works led those wide, those room-sized works 
led to further very specific works. If we look, can we look at the next slide in her um, Harper series, Chastity? Um, she began to do um, soon after a series, which in fact, it, this has been um, an, a current exhibition of a collection from these works from the Smithsonian was, has been um, traveling in the United States, unfortunately under the pandemic, but um, in which she did this series of uh, works using uh, Harper's Weekly, which was the publication during the Civil War that literally artists created images of what occurred in the Civil War. And this was a means of disseminating the news and the information about the Civil War to others. She took that idea and landscape was something she made very clear was constructed. And it was constructed in such a way and history was constructed in such a way that those most important in this story of the Civil War were left out and Kara made sure that we knew who was missing. And you see here in this particular image, um, the individual, the slave, the, 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 the guy who was doing the work and was being freed through the Civil War. And she makes sure that that is the most important part of this image. Chastity, would you like to talk a little bit about, I know you and I have had a long talk about this particular landscape and who and how landscape um, both is body and also very specific site in the South, which is something we bring, we bring out further when we talk about Kara's work. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about uh, uh, the things that you and I've shared and discussed about this, the Harper series, this and the next slide. Absolutely. I think you touched on some of the most important aspects of um, what we've talked about previously, that this was a, um, an intervention, um, that it's a screen print superimposed onto a, an image that was meant to tell a story that was widely disseminated. Um, and one that was, like you said, a construction, um, a story, a narrative that is um, a construction. Um, but again, because of its wide dissemination, um, becomes easily um, kind of stitched into the fabric of, of all of our stories. And so I think that the specific intervention here um, that Carl Walker makes by really obstructing this story um, with her own, what has become her own language and idiom um, mm -hmm. is one that, that we've talked about. And I, and I think that using the silhouette using the body of the person who is missing from this story um, to obstruct that narrative is one that was a powerful one. Um, yeah. And how about in the next slide? We have another um, print in our, in our collection from Kara's series, which yeah. two, sorry, keep going. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that again, you know, I, I think one of the things that was really kind of poetic in our focusing on USA idioms as um, the work that we came together to discuss um, is that it nods to this, this uh, developing of a language. Um, and, and certainly Carl Walker, like many others, has developed a specific language through the cut paper silhouette. And once again, she makes another intervention here. Um, it's not quite as obstructing necessarily of this this broader this broader narrative that's being told but certainly she is um including this this image that is so distinctively hers um and merging it into this image in a way that changes the entire story um and i think that one of the things that we talked about in terms of of landscape too is a theme and that is running through these images that is important is the use of trees and moss, um, and mm -hmm. moss particularly as something mm -hmm. that nods to the place, mm -hmm. the specific place. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you know, of course, there are um, there are potential um, connections to the United States Southern landscape uh, with these um, with these references uh, to the moss and trees that we talked about. Um, and it's important in terms of her biography to just mention that she, you know, moved from California to Atlanta, Georgia, when she was 13. And mm -hmm. so, and she, and it has been noted that this had a significant, you know, impact on her choice of, of subject matter. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that this, this repetition um, throughout these, these three works really of specific nods to place are, um, are important to notice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead back to um, uh, the image of USA idioms 
for a minute, and, and then we'll go into the details that you and I have talked about here, if you wouldn't mind. Um, one of the things when you talk about place, which was really significant, as you said, moving to the South, and that very much became a part of, of many of her works and has been, um, there, there are indications of with the, the Spanish moss hanging off the trees and the individuals in this kind of setting, the Confederate flag, one of the things you and I talked about it was how landscape became both specific to this southern context, put us in that place, but it also in the case of these trees was a way of showing um, the, the wounds of war, the wounds of the, the violence of slavery and um, the trees. And so therefore a physically landscape element of landscape became another means of suggesting body and what has happened to the body of those um, who suffered under slavery and, and really scorched the earth of it, but the, the trees here are kind of bound together with bandages and ripped apart and draped with moss and barely held together as you see time and again the limbs and and I wonder if um, it you you when we spoke uh, just yesterday in fact talking further about this idea of the body and the symbols that she uses both of body and in landscape you talked about the flags mm -hmm. I wonder if you might open that up a little because the, the tree bears the flags and the wounds and the individuals who, who jump or sit or, 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 or you know, poised against them. And you're talking- Yeah, about yeah. I mean, we specifically talked about, and this is something that, that's run throughout all of our conversations, even a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, is mm -hmm. the way that she uses the repetition of certain elements to mm -hmm. move our eye around the piece, of course, um, yeah. just as a matter of um, having a place to land your eyes and really taking in the image. But mm -hmm. then further, the ways in which she's using very specific things that then if you stay with it, really jump out at you. And so we talked mm -hmm. yesterday specifically about these flags, the placement of the flags. Um, and if you'll notice, there's a Confederate flag. There's also yeah. a couple of flags that are indeterminate, but there's also um, an American flag at the bottom right hand corner um, mm -hmm. and it's crumpled up and, you know, it, it you know, all of the flags are exhibiting some some source of distress, but um, the one at the bottom is almost barely legible. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that we talked about was in terms of the really thinking about legal boundaries, the ways in which citizenship is determined by mm -hmm. all of these things, legal mm -hmm. boundaries. It's also, um, mm -hmm. it's also reinforced by symbols um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. easily read um, elements. And so I think that's one of the ways in which this particular intervention, so uh, recent from 2017, responding specifically to the events in Charlottesville, um, mm -hmm. that she's using these, these touch points um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to extract additional meaning. Um, and it really does, um, you know, very much fits in line with so much of her work, which is um, this nod to outside references, things that we can that we can that we feel as if we recognize, but we can mm -hmm. barely say mm -hmm. for certain, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. that is one of the the really uh, additional poetic elements in there that mm -hmm. they, we have these recognizable symbols, but what do they really mean, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and who and the, they and the, for? Um, sure. Yeah. And the deliberateness, which has always been true in her work, of choosing semi, as you say, recognizable characters that may come from literally from popular culture, from literature, from books, child, children's books, that mix of characters we recognize that she deliberately places in a, a landscape for us to interpret. And I know that, that one of the things she's always left open is how exactly one is going to interpret what you see. And I, I know, um, Art historian Ann Wagner once said that, you know, the, the, you bring as much to the image by your own interpretation as you do, um, at, at your own interpretation says as much about you as it does about what she's in fact stating in her, in her image. And she leaves it open for that reason. But the, the whole construction of the image is something that I think is really important to, to be clear and, and deliberate about um, is that we talked about the scale of this being so large. So physically very, very difficult to make a drawing of this size, but it is collage and therefore 
with ink, she has, with Sumi ink, she has drawn these figures, cut them out, and then placed them on the paper. So when we talk about constructing landscape and these symbols that you were just mentioning, Chastity, and the ways in which she is responding to Charlottesville at that moment, there is a deliberate way that she constructed and placed, quite literally physically placed each of these figures to a, around the, the ground, as you say, so that your eye goes here and there. And I wonder if you might, might add further, I mean, our own reactions as we would talk about this in the gallery of how each time we saw it, each time we looked at this, what we did see or didn't see, the zooming in, zooming out that you and I have talked about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's um, one of the things that I, I, I'll actually, um, in a way, kind of add to that is that it's just such a massive scale, right? Yeah. And so in addition to all of the kind of rich detail, um, especially the- Let's go ahead and show some of the detail, actually. Sorry. In that yeah, scene. yeah. I mean, I, thanks. Yeah, and in, in addition to the, the rich detail, it's so- incredibly engrossing and, 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 and um, it draws you in because of the scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in this medium, the rendering it in the Sumi ink and the graphite, um, you are kind of compelled to get close and kind of see those marks. Um, and I think that something that, that really stood out about what you just said was in terms of the ways that she uses all of these different elements, the way that she renders mm -hmm. um, the picture, also the, the nods that she makes to outside sources is, is a way of giving lots of touchstones for the viewer to come into the picture um, and make meaning. But it's also so much about this work and being and sitting with this work and it's being a drawing um, kind of as mm -hmm. opposed to the cut paper silhouettes and having mm -hmm. all of that rich detail um, and texture um, really made mm -hmm. me think about when Gwendolyn Shaw writes about Kara Walker mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how she she leveraged Michelle Wallace's um, literary critical theory on the conception of the Black woman artist as the other of the other. And she talks mm -hmm. about how in she reads one of Walker's self portraits as quote revealing the artist's self realization of her status as the other of the other and one who dares to mm -hmm. speak the unspeakable. And so while you know we we're definitely sitting in a place where you and I have had a particular interaction over and over with this work and like you said it continues to um, to reveal different things that jump out at us that we've kind of set with. I mm -hmm. think that it's one of the, uh, one of the, the hallmarks um, of the efforts that Kara Walker has made to um, address issues in this kind of indeterminate way is that it is allowing you to think about who gets to tell particular stories and that the story can get told differently depending mm -hmm. on who's doing the telling, so mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to um, the next artist who actually has done the same kind of in a very different way, taking us to a place of who tells the stories, who is missing from the stories, and how do we, how do we actually get brought into the story that was missing before? So let's move ahead to um, Carrie James Marshall. This work, is this extraordinary work in our collection, which I'm hoping to hang in um, the next year or two. Um, it fills an entire room. There are 12 panels, each of which is eight feet tall by about four feet wide. It is a woodblock print that Carrie James Marshall created. And the whole idea of creating, as we just talked about, the, the scale of Kara's Walker and Kara Walker's drawing and this magnificent, extraordinary mural size scale is one thing. What Carrie does here is similarly in, in a kind of monumental work um, that is literally hard to believe that someone could do a woodblock print of this scale, but it is also a multi-paneled woodblock print that takes you, the viewer, into a space 
in a private setting, in an inner landscape, in a sense, a, a, a private landscape in, inside of this apartment building, and takes us into a world that hadn't been shown. And he is very deliberate in his career about focus. He, he studied the history of art in such a way, and I know um, this is something, Chastity, you and I have talked about at length, the, the importance of bringing the Black body into worlds that the Black body wasn't shown before. But not only that, but taking us here into their pro the private space of, of one's life um, in a genre scene and an enormous scale so that you as the viewer, do you have the, please the next slide so you can see how large in a room. This is when it was installed at the Sackler, which gives you some sense of the scale of the work and how you as the viewer walk into a room and you become enclosed by this incredible multi-panel print. Um, and, and there you are in the room with them in a way that is both extraordinary visually as a work of art, but also gives you pause because you feel as if you're in a sense intruding into a private world that yet has very clear um, links to an art historical past. And I wonder, Chastity, if you, that's something you and I've talked a lot about um, in, in, in Carrie's um, practice, the, the history of art is very much something that he's aware of and, and makes reference to, but his own abilities to take that and make it something completely different and outside of what one expects is just, um, is a reason that this never stops give, filling me with awe when I see it, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, you touched on so many of the things that we've talked about over and over again with this work. It's really, for me, it was just unbelievable when I first encountered the work that it was a woodcut, that he had devised a way to um, execute this woodcut on his own. Um, and so he devised a system uh, to be able to, to make this work. And you know, it's in line with so many of the works that he became famous for in the 1990s in terms of its monumental scale and its, you know, uh, basically it's, it's, it's real insertion of, like you said, the black body into the grand tradition. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it's one of the things that, that we talked about, and I think that you've also nodded to in terms of talking about that particular type of intervention that Carrie James Marshall makes is, that he is using the a, a medium um, here that is not usually executed on this scale, but that he also often uses grommets to hang works um, yes. and uses a, a variety of different ways to actually bring the, the artwork to the wall. And one of the things that we talked about, um, I believe this was yesterday, um, we were talking about Molesworth and her essay on Carrie James Marshall and the mastery um, catalog yeah. and specifically yeah. about her contention that he is executing a very specific kind of institutional critique, um, but he's doing it with traditional yes. media. Um, and yeah. I think that that's yeah. something that, um, yes. you know, is, is really something that we really have to pause on with respect to Carrie James Marshall's work and to think about the context in which he was working um, and what was going on in the art world at the time. Um, and so her bringing that into the conversation mm -hmm. really does give it um, mm -hmm. this deep understanding of the ways in which he was working kind of against the grain um, in, a, mm -hmm. in a way to go mm -hmm. back and mm -hmm. do course corrective. Um, and here, like you, like you also mentioned, he is working in appropriation. You know, he's bringing in references to Manet um, that, we, that we've mm -hmm. talked about. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, let's look at the detail. Uh, that go to ahead to show just so uh, yeah. back to that one, but please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it you know, I, I think that one of the things that we've talked about with respect to this work too that just really jumps out at you are the colors um, and the color of the floor, right? Presumably carpet, but it's rendered in mm -hmm. this green. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, may, maybe a nod here um, mm -hmm. in, in, in his. Uh, in his quite characteristic way of, um, of nodding to art's history and inserting those who are not usually seen. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, yeah. You also talked, I mean, in, in talking about color and, and position and relating to Manet's um, 
figures in some way, but also the way in which, and one of the things that he talks about himself is how he portrays the black body. And in fact, um, this color of black skin. And, and it was something you and I discussed in, in his paintings, most often the skin is all of the same exact tone, but you were noting when we talked about this, it was very deliberate in this woodcut that it's everybody, their skin color varies. And that also you were saying, to add a little more to that, if you would mind, please. Robert. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, one of the things that's most noted um, about Carrie James Marshall's work um, and in one of the essays um, in the master catalog as well, uh, begins with this wonderful uh, meditation on that very thing, which is the nod to materiality, the nod to the tools that Carrie James Marshall marshals <laughs> in his work. and. He uses mostly um, three shades of black in the in the pieces that this particular um, writer was was talking about, and it's iron oxide, Mars black, and carbon black. Um, and you know he he sticks with these tools, um, and he's able to make slight variations throughout, but it's very much on purpose because they carry that particular meaning into into the into the work but one of the things that we talked about with respect to this work are the two figures here that are on each side of um, these panels that are pictured here that are rendered it appears in brown um, you know and i i think that it's one of the things that we've stopped and talked about many times that at first we didn't even notice um, and I think that that's one of the things about revisiting works that you feel as if you've come to really know. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things about Carl Walker's work and Carrie James Marshall's work and certainly Howard Dina Pendel's work, that what they choose as their tools and what they develop as a very specific language within each of their careers, um, and it really becomes their trademarks. It's, it's as if you can you can see these moments where they're causing you to stop and rethink, um, and I, I just love these moments. And I and I I'll I'll go to one of the yeah. um, in, installation photos yeah. because one of the other things that we talked about, um, and this brings into, you know, it 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 brings up this idea of how color is used, but then also how repetition is used, how, mm -hmm. um, how figures become iconic, and these placement of these rectangles throughout the piece um, that we talked about um, was mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. moment of, you know, I, the repetition that he's able to achieve becomes part of this language that has all of these other touch points that are coming in. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, just thinking about the use of black and abstract art um, mm -hmm. and some of the things that we talked about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're talking the black squares on the wall in particular, which are both you see here and in the image you just showed that go throughout the whole of the landscape. And what, what do those signify, which I had never really focused on them until you began to kind of unpack that for me and how he uses it. Would you go back please for a second to the, the full um, installation? Yeah, or that one, yes. In which you have this sense of the whole of the space these, these guys are hanging out in, um, but he leaves a sense of mystery, which I would say in some way the ambiguity that we find in Kara's work, he adds to and that you have the bedroom door open, you have these black squares, which literally have nothing on them or in them, or even do they suggest figures or landscapes or still lives, they, they're black and there's shadowy movement in them, but that is also, it seems, the, the woodblock print is, is allowing that to become more ambiguous in a really interesting way. Um, and, and then to your point, relating all of this back to geography and landscape, you, one of the things we talked about was that also like Kara, Carrie was born in one place and ended up in a very different culture. So he was born in Birmingham, Alabama, and then moved to California, Southern California, 
um, where he was really exposed to and went to, Lachman went to the museum and saw these masterpieces and became really focused there and then ended up ultimately in Chicago, which is where he is now. But he, he takes with him these experiences and this cultural change that he was exposed to, um, which I think is something that is also really, has been critically interesting to his, his career in general um, and the way in which he has painted and created prints. Um, would, you, would you mind please going to the, the slide of the Chicago Library for a second? And, and here, for example, is going back to one of the key points you made, um, Chastity, about the fact that these, these works he creates typically, like, like this was a commission in 1993, he painted this for the Chicago Public Library. There's no frame, it's hung on the wall in grommets. It's the canvas right there, but again, the scale of a mural with the, 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 the scale and the majesty of, a, of an enormous history painting. And that deliberateness is, is part of what he is, you know, rendering for us and making black bodies be part of the majesty of this history painting. And this, this work called Knowledge and Wonder, the other thing he does is he brings us in just as he did, does in the woodblock print, he brings us right into the space with his, with his um, figures. I mean, they all have their backs to us. They're all looking at books and, and being part of the wonder and, and knowledge. But in fact, the viewer is also in their space with them, almost unable to step back um, and, and marveling at this. And there's no frame to make this a more formal separate work. It is part of the wall, it is part of our experience. And he does that repeatedly in a way that you and I were talking um, as well about the way in which he portrays family and interaction between people with a cheerfulness and a sense of music playing. And But there are these layers to what he's really it can vein. And I, I wonder if you might add a little to that as I got all excited about this work as well. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that's perfect. I mean, I, and I think what I would add is that, like you said, he's, he's painting this particular story. I mean, there, there's a narrative here. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that the efforts to tell a counter narrative um, are, are, deeply connected to his work with Charles White at the Otis Institute in California, yeah. right? And so um, going from Birmingham to California and then his trajectory there to the Otis Art Institute and really seeking Charles White out as a mentor and, an, and a teacher, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, um, you know, he's, he's talked about just the influence that Charles White had on his decision to really make an effort to find a way in his own way to um, pre present this counter narrative. And so there's that. But in addition to that, what I was bringing up with respect to the woodcut is that Carrie James Marshall is once again, the deafness with which he merges um, explorations of form um, into these broader conversations and the way that he wrenches meaning from the way that he uses form, the tools in his toolbox um, is something that I think is really important to, to talk about with respect to his work. And one of the things that we talked about before were, again, here, the repetition, um, these, these forms that almost look like uh, surfboards um, in the air and on the ground. Um, maybe they're mm -hmm. shadows, maybe they're, um, mm -hmm. maybe they're actually objects, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. we're not entirely sure it's indeterminate, mm -hmm. but we mm -hmm. talked about the figure that seems like there's a figure in the air. There's here a sense yeah. that we really, we really don't, we can't quite place everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he does that by including all of these elements of repeated formal, um, yeah. uh, you know, places to, to land our eye, to make us, mm -hmm. pull us into the picture, um, mm -hmm. so. We should um, uh, now I'd love to reach out to the great teacher and the one who's been the most kind of uh, had many lives um, in addition to as an artist, one who's both aesthetically and politically been very engaged and is having a resurgence of 
of kind of incredible focus and popularity, Howardina Pindell with her current show at, at, at the Shed and um, a new book. And she is one of the three artists who's a focus of your dissertation. So um, I will admit from the beginning, I was most excited to have this discussion with you to learn from you about Pindell. And before us is a, a relatively new addition to our collection, um, a print by Pindell autobiography. And so, we take the look at landscape and think of it both as literally places she has been and body and presence of Pindell, because so much is personal from what you've shared with me, um, and place it in this landscape and, and the figures, the shadows, linking back to almost the cutout silhouettes that Carol Walker um, focused on and has focused on for so long. This print is one that there's enigma, there's joy, there are recognizable art historical great icons of the past and various cultures. Please open it up a little for us, Chastity, in terms of how you see her very particular um, practice and autobiography as it fits body into landscape and her own story of travel. Absolutely. Um, so she began the autobiography series kind of proper um, because it includes a number of different, variety of different media and it's an ongoing um, project um, or was a project that extended for a long period of time. Um, she began that in 1980 um, and she actually sees Free White in 21, her, um, her video uh, detailing racism that she and her mother experienced as black women. Um, especially her experience working um, in feminist efforts um, and the racism that she experienced within within those um, within those institutions, um, she sees that video "Free White in 21" as the beginning of the autobiography series, and so this is a, a good example here of thinking about um, this execution of this theme in these variety of media. And um, we also see that in the 1980s, um, she continues to extend this into other media with this piece um, that's a, a beautiful example, um, acrylic and mix, mixed media. Um, but she also has other works that recall other landscapes, recall other um, travels. She has um, a series that is focused on India. Um, she also has series that make reference to Egypt. Um, and these are all things that touch on kind of her personal story, her personal story in, in terms of travel. Um, but here you can see that she's also um, making reference to um, the Middle Passage um, there's a cutout, kind of an, an absence here um, that's created in the form of a slave ship. Um, there are also other references here to um, separate but equal. Um, but one of the things that we specifically talked about in terms of Pindell and landscape was, and you've mentioned this a couple of times, is the use of body as landscape. And so um, here, it's like a trace of her body here um, that is one of the main figures that's um, on this piece. And so it's referencing back here to the hands, to the visage. Um, and here, almost very much like this piece, all of these various elements that are brought in um, are kind of leveled to the same space. And I think it's, I'm glad that we really focused on this lithograph in the collection because by nature of it being a, a lithograph, I think it really guided us to thinking about how she is bringing all these disparate elements in and almost leveling them to the, play, to the point where she's bringing them all in as part of her personal story. Um, and so, yeah. One of the things, to, but as we say, lithograph and, and seeing her work as a lithograph is something you commented. It's really, there's a kind of irony at the same time that it's really exciting to see it because she has been, as you explained to me, her work, I mean, she's explored various mediums over time, but so often the hand is, is essential and the 
African textile tradition, you said, was a very important part of her work. And the other work we have by her in our collection is one of her Chad pieces. So, which I'd, I'd love you to open up a little this whole idea of the hand done work and mix of materials and what that means, which isn't as apparent, obviously, in the lithograph as, as this or the Chad work, but tell us a little bit about why she did that and what, why, how it is so much an important and integral part of her practice. Yeah, but I mean, I, American woman and as an artist who lived through these decades of extraordinary change, having been working at MoMA, having been at Yale, having yeah, all of the, there's a lot. <laughs> there, there, there is so much, um, and I wish we had more time to talk about it. But I think one mm -hmm. of the things that I found, I, I just found wonderful about the way that her work has been framed in the Fire, Rope, and Water show is that it's a way of healing, especially the abstract paintings that are that are um, that are included in the show. And so these are, she's saying that these are works that she goes to as a place of healing to. Um, cut and sew and glue and this repetitive work that she's doing with all of these tiny, tiny chads. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that Naomi Beckwith, a curator um, who's written on Pendel, um, wrote about was that she turned to actually gluing the chads and working with the chads because she didn't have adequate light. And so this idea that she's turning to the tactile and the haptic um, in that particular kind of way, um, I think really is a, a good way of thinking about artist choices, um, but also thinking about, like you said, this, this importance of the actual repetitive, this handmade practice um, that Pendel develops and that she continues, right? So it's not just a matter of necessity, it becomes a trademark of her practice. Um, and she includes it time and time again in a variety of different ways. And so I think that to answer your question, it's really remarkable how this latest exhibition, this latest work, she's, she's once again bringing it into this contemporary moment, like us reflecting on what this country is going through and by extension, really um, things that are affecting the, uh, the world, um, that she is coming back to her practice and thinking about these things that she's been doing over time as specifically as healing mechanisms for her as an artist. Um, and so I think that that is, that really strikes at the heart of what you're talking about. It encapsulates all of these things, all of these efforts as an educator a critic um, and an artist to do the reparative work um, that she sees as, as necessary um, and that that can be integrated and expressed in a variety of different ways and that it almost needs to be expressed, I would say, in all of these different ways. So yeah, no, no boundaries really, right, between the work of what we consider to be one, one kind of siloed experience and the other, right? Um, and I think yeah. that, you know, it goes, it goes back to, to many times in arts history where artists are grappling with this idea of how much do I, you know, engage in the social issues? Um, and, and, and is it appropriate to do that in my art? Um, or is it the converse? Is it not appropriate to, to make art and to ignore the, the social. So, yeah. Well, she's a figure who clearly has, has, has really grappled with that and found that, as you say, no boundaries. She, she has explored and I think, if anything, to, to see the attention she's receiving now is really kind of really, um, it, it gives you great energy and hope, to be honest, um, because I do think, uh, this year in particular is our art has been a way for us to find our spirit and find our strength and her career epitomizes that I think. and I see that so young is appearing which means we are at our time <laughs> I have popped up despite wanting to stay 
off camera and keep listening to you because it has been such a joy and such an education. And it's really made me miss seeing both of you and, and these works and your, um, you know, highlighting the materiality and the technique, all of that really reminds us why we need to see them in person, right? Um, yes. So you do have questions from your fans, uh, but before we get to the questions, I wanted to quickly ask you, Mary, well, sure. I wanted to note for our audiences that I, I, I think it's clear, but to emphasize that the works you presented were all works on paper, which is a great strength of our collection and which is why you don't always see them displayed in the galleries because they are light sensitive. But we do have our art study seminar rooms where we try to bring out these works that aren't always on the walls. Yeah. Um, but we've recently acquired uh, yes. drawings <laughs> by yes. an artist that we're very excited about. So thought perhaps yeah. you could tell us a little bit about that. Very yes, I'm very thank thank you for asking so young. Um, a, a new acquisition that just we just uh, finalized at the end of 2020 um, is the work of Toyan Oje Odutula, who's a Nigerian-born, um, New York-based artist. All of her work is drawing, actually, and so although it appears and really when we talk about close looking, her work really demands close looking. It's just incredibly detailed and. There are figures, um, oftentimes, and in this case, this was an exhibition that was in New York at a gallery this fall. Um, you see to the right, I, I use both images so you can see she put a, um, a written kind of text there, which you as a viewer look at the drawing, you see the title, you see the text, you assume the text relates to the drawing, but in fact, her work is really about, and she talks very clearly about not wanting to tell you exactly what to think. In fact, the text does not relate directly to the, the young woman you see here. Rather, it is meant to show the discrepancy between text and image and how we each interpret things in our own way and how that ambiguity between the two is really a part of reflecting and thinking about what you see and how someone is portrayed and what you think that person is about and what they um, suggest to you. So there's a, a level and a, a, an important narrative that goes on in her work without her being incredibly specific about what you're supposed to know. And there's um, there are two more drawings in addition to this one, if you, um, Chastity. This is a second one, um, the trap vowel. This is actually much larger than the slide um, allows you to see and um, all done in graphite. And so it the, the, the flesh and skin of the figure and the, the gentleman behind her is so incredibly velvety and smooth. And the, the, the line and the hand of the artist is something that you are fully absorbed by when you see her drawings. It's just, uh, it's, it's truly remarkable. It's kind of a, a kind of awe-inspiring. I have to admit when I saw it, I just about dropped to my knees <laughs> to be honest, it's so incredibly beautiful. And then the third drawing is a color drawing. Um, Nanban, which is in fact, um, and, and so Young was the one who very, very kindly and smartly gave me a real sense of how important this drawing was in the sense that Nanban is a, was a Japanese term used for foreigner. It's much more than that, but, um, and so this, this title is a very interesting one. It turns out this is actually the artist's brother who often um, is a um, model for her drawings, uh, but he's, he's this, as I say, it's colored um, graphite and ink, and it's on, um, behind him is a Japanese screen, which you get a very clear sense of when you, you see the drawing in person. So the story and what is not being said and what you interpret becomes even more kind of provocative and interesting, knowing the title, knowing the figure, knowing the context. Um, so we really look forward to showing these again because they are works on paper so young so they won't be able to be up in the gallery for long periods of time but a visit to the art study center will be something we welcome so thank you mary and let's take a question from our audience a few questions around carrie james marshall clearly you've sparked a lot of uh, interest um you mentioned the reference to manet uh there's a question though about does Carrie James Marshall referenced Francis Bacon's figures in a room in both space and color. Uh, what is your take on that, Chastity? That is not something I've ever heard. 
you're a PhD student right now, so I'm sure. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I that that's a new one for me too. Really I, I'm I'm very interested in that though. Um, I thought it was an interesting suggestion, and thought but very, if you had any yeah. thoughts, perhaps something to think about. Very much so. No, that Would definitely say, gives us something to think about. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Person. Would you say a little bit more about the the specific Manet reference? Oh, that was yes. one of the questions for this work. Please. Yes. So, um, Les Déjeuners sur l'eau. Um, mm. And I, you know, okay. these seated figures in the grass. Um, and I mean, certainly not. Uh, you know, not a direct copy, right? Of course, a, a reinterpretation um, and one that's not meant to, uh, you know, it, it doesn't strike me as being meant to, it, what, what does he say? He says, I'm not out to necessarily um, critique, but to expand, right? And so to use this, this recognizable, positioning, use this recognizable composition to mm -hmm. bring in a new story. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that, um, yeah, I think that you can see this throughout his career where he's doing this, this very thing, mm -hmm. which is nodding to something. I mean, it's one of the first things that came to mind for me, but yeah. then you just start to see all of the ways in which it's telling a different story, um, one that's yeah. been left out. So. Yeah, yes. which is really critical to his work, and I think it's really important. So, yeah, very good point. Staying with Carrie James Marshall, uh, Chastity, there was a question on, or could you speak a little bit more about his institutional critique, since you mentioned that while you were talking? Sure. Um, so I specifically, um, I'll. You know, I wanted to say that, I wanted to use that as a term, <laughs> like to apply to his work, like before I read Helen Molesworth's Helen, essay yeah. on it. And then yeah. I read her essay and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like, of course. I mean, she just, yes. she just puts it beautifully, right? Like she situates she it within mm -hmm. the, you know, his, uh, his coming up in a time where you see artists moving more to, minimalism and conceptual art um, and what people have read as the things that follow right institutional critique amongst them and that Kerry James Marshall is at that very moment saying well wait a minute I want to gain mastery of these mm -hmm. traditional ways of representing these traditional ways of working in the media and mm -hmm. working in the museum and talking about the museum there's an unfinished story here that doesn't quite get told as easily in these other movements that i see coming through and so i think um i think it's just such a great turn to interrogate his work within that question of what kinds of what are the the broad um scope of ways that we can look at work like this as institu mm -hmm. institutional critique. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, because we're short on time, I, I'll say, you know, I, I really, you know, recommend reading that and thinking about yeah, whether or not you, you, you know, what you think of that argument. But I, I, I did mm -hmm. find it very convincing, especially because I thought about, I was like, oh, that's the perfect word for this. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm trying to figure out which one to privilege given the, uh, limited time. Um, so one observation, three artists you have presented in this talk keep their imageries purposefully ambiguous. Um, is it just provocation or is there more? Is there something more in, in the ambiguity of the works? Or would you agree that there's ambiguity, purposeful ambiguity? I, 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 I'm going to jump in first, but um, I'd love to hear Chassie's thoughts on this as well. I was thinking as we worked on this, I was thinking to myself, both Carrie James Marshall and Kara Walker really began to be incredibly important in the 90s 
And then they were both creating figurative works in different ways, but both of them. In 1997, he presented a whole series of his, his paintings at Documenta. In 1997, she got a MacArthur Fellowship and had a um, retrospective. They, they were really in the, the light of, of an attention of, of a wider um, audience at that point in a very significant way. And I, my, I don't fully know, if the, I just know from the way they both began, they were speaking about um, and they talked about one of the things that we talked about chastity a lot in the last um, weeks is the, the the black body not being represented that it wasn't a part of the dialogue in the history of art and in the scenes that um, and the kinds of works that were being created I mean it, it was in some level but both of them focused on this in their own ways and and I wonder if present they presented their work in such a way to to make he would he would bring us to you know, the, the um, affordable housing areas he lived in and show picnics and people getting their hair cut and birthday parties. And so, and we would just be filled with the lives of these individuals who hadn't been shown in, in the works of art previously. She took us back to a history of the, the Victorian woman cutting out cutouts, but she put it front and center in a way that was really aggressively forcing a reality to be addressed. Um, and I don't know that hers were quite so ambiguous. I think that whether how she, you'd interpret it is one thing, but I think there was a, a pretty clear line to, to be reading. And I think his as well, in a different way, was making a very serious statement. He talks about the choice of black pigment and as Chastity mentioned and, and making clear it was black um, and very deliberately choosing um, in the pigment so that there was a certainty of the individual you were looking at and the statement he was making. So I guess maybe my, that's my long way of saying, I think it was a little less ambiguous than it might appear when you look at some of the, the, the titles of, or the narrative that you think you're seeing in some of the paintings, I don't know. Chessie, what, how, would, how would you respond to all that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, provocation is, a, is, is quite a term. Like, and so I think that it's, uh, I, I think that I would, I think I step back a couple of, I think I take a couple of steps back, right? And I think that one of the things we talked about in our conversations, Mary, in, you know, leading up to this conversation is that setting Carrie James Marshall and Carol Walker side by side in this way, um, and, and like So Young noted, you know, in drawing and the woodcut and the large scale and um, the particular kinds of ways in which the figures are represented, um, the you know really the 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 ways in which they use um, the different media to register gesture uh, or gestures, um, and I think that really all of those things, right, like run throughout their practice. Like th those are representative of like very um, distinct ways in which they leverage what I keep on referring to are the tools that they've gained from, you know, th that they've chosen really to leverage. So, but I think that, um, I, I think that it is a really good question as to whether or not artists who are doing those things, right? They're, they're making specific reference to things that carry with them very direct meanings. Um, maybe there are a ton of meanings, right? So you have to choose. But calling the ambiguity is something that I think we specifically talked about with respect to Walker and representing like this idea that you can't nail down, like you can't believe the history you've been told. So the way that she retells a nostalgic Southern history, the way she reframes the lost cause um, is it's it right, it, right? It, it, it depends on what you mean by like, um, um, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a good question, obviously, right? Because it causes you to really sit with it because mm -hmm. you have to define mm -hmm. what you mean by, um, by being provocative. And I think these two artists represent 
maybe different sides, they represent a juxtaposition in that respect, right? If you're talking about um, the tr like the effort to introduce like different narratives, right? Like a, a recuperative narrative or a critical narrative, like th these are these are two things that are that sometimes work hand in hand, but they um, but they certainly are two different things too. And so I just yeah, I just I think it's a great question, and I think it goes to the heart of a lot of the things that that you you and I, Mary, have talked about. Um, but it's a difficult one to answer because I think that it is part of what makes their work <laughs> so compelling. <laughs> so. And then you hit right on the nail. And yeah. we love difficult questions or questions that yeah. don't have easy answers and ask us to probe further. Yes. Perhaps one final question. Speaking of juxtaposition or pairing, there's a comment about the, you know, curious to see the uh, pairing of um, Walker and Pindell together in this yes. presentation. And yes. we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on Pindell's sharp critique of Walker's imagery. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is worth addressing or trying to reconcile? Or, you know, are there just two disparate positions yeah. on representation of, you know, for Black artists? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, we, Mary and I definitely talked about this. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, yeah, we did. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, and I certainly like in earlier conversations, you know, um, alluded to it because I mean, Hardy Newmandel has written specifically about Carl Walker's work um, in the yeah. '90s, um, and so yeah, I mean, I think that it is, it is a question that is always worth talking about. Um, I think that it's partly because it has become a part of the historical record, but then also because the issues that are brought up by talking about um, that dialogue, that particular dialogue, is one that runs throughout Black art's story, right? Like um, in terms of what are the stakes of different types of representation? Um, what are the stakes of, um, of voicing critique, um, of engaging in a public dialogue? Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, you know, we alluded to over and over by talking about Pindell's um, role as not only an artist, but as a critic, as a curator, um, as a, really a fixture in art as an institution in so many mm -hmm. different ways. And it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why she has become in particular a touchstone for me, um, because while I focus on a particular part of her practice, of her early practice. Um, and it's been so incredibly instructive in terms of my research questions. All of those things that she represents have been incredibly important outside of the, the work that I focus on, right? Like, I mean, as a Black woman myself, you know, a Black woman from the South in particular, I mean, these are all things that are personal to me as well. So to have these artists who have become so, um, you know, they, they have such a public platform um, in our country. They become, they, they literally take up a lot of space in our galleries and our museums. Um, I, I see those questions as incredibly important. Um, and I'm constantly going over and over them. I'm constantly having discussions with my friends and my family. Um, like Gwendolyn Shaw says in her, in her book on Carl Walker, you know, she's like, I had heated discussions with my friends and family. I mean, and, and having somebody like Pendell, who has this body of work where she's writing about Carl Walker, but she's also writing about all manner of things, um, it has been incredibly important. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on it. Well, we're grateful for artists who, um, you know, bring new ways of seeing and thinking and, and allow us to have these kinds of conversations and discussions. And sadly, we have reached the end of the program. Um, so it's, it's sort of my role to bring this, to wrap this up, but I'd like to thank 
both of you, Chastity and Mary, for an incredibly engaging, compelling, thoughtful presentation and conversation. Um, now, before we formally end the program, I would like to call your attention to a few things. First, that you will receive a, a short survey when you leave tonight's webinar, and we would be very grateful for your feedback. And next, I want to invite you to join us for our um, Reframe series of Art Talks Live, which will take place every other Tuesday afternoon at 12.30 p.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, from uh, this month, March, until June. And the next talk in the series will take place on March 23rd, um, and we will explore the art of extinction in early modern Europe with graduate intern Sarah Mallory. We have a lot of virtual programs happening in the days and weeks ahead, so I encourage you to keep an eye on our calendar and sign up for our newsletters so that you can receive regular updates. Thank you again, Mary and Chastity, and thank you, our audiences who audience who have tuned in um, and given us your evening. And with that, I bid you good evening and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.